back, did a survey of the profession throughout the world. And they came out with the final finding that the legal profession has become a fiercely competitive business. It was no more a profession. And even in India, I find uh, that we lawyers, most of us, do not have a real commitment as such. We are not anxious to do pro bono work. We do not readily participate in uh, legal aid work. And uh, a section of us is charged with having demanded and obtained very, very high fees in indeed. And last of all, and this is to the disgrace of the legal profession, we go on strikes. The Supreme Court had said in 2002 that strikes were not permitted, strikes are prohibited, except in one rare case, and that is where public interest was involved. But nevertheless, we find from time to time the bar going on strikes, not in public interest, but because they were personally affected. In fact, they went to the extent of saying that if foreign lawyers are brought in, then we'll have to go on strike. They believed that the foreign lawyers would come and take away the work from the trial courts. I don't think any of them would dare to come to the trial courts, these Azari or any other place to argue cases. But nevertheless, this was a feeling. They took out a procession once. They wanted to go to Parliament uh, House. And unfortunately, on the day after this judgment was delivered, no less than the Bar Council of India called for a strike along with all the bars in India because they had a grievance. And this has continued. And I do not think that we can find uh, an end to it. And recently, I think it is Justice Goel, who is no more a judge of the Supreme Court, he had to summon the uh, uh, the president of the Bar Association of Kolkata, of the Kolkata High Court. And that gentleman came, they had gone on strike for no good reason. And it went on for a month. And when he was summoned, uh, he came and he apologized. And uh, the court accepted the apology. And they assured that this will not happen again. But this is not something which is uh, restricted to India. Not strikes, but the decline in the reputation and the standards of the profession. In the United States, padding hourly bills is the most common thing. In fact, somebody calculated and said a associate has billed for uh, more than the number of hours, working hours in a day for the entire year, if you count. And uh, that has become endemic. So far as England is concerned, the number of uh, display cases were such that uh, they found that the law society was unable to cope up with these cases. And they therefore had to appoint an ombudsman who is now overloaded with work. And therefore, this is what has happened. The Economist Survey found that Japan, in, law, in, uh, uh, in Japan, the lawyers, if they wanted office space, the landlord would straight away refuse it. The moment they realized that uh, these were law, uh, they belonged to the legal profession. And unfortunately, in Delhi also, this is what has been happening. A lawyer finds it very, very difficult to get accommodation because the landlords uh, don't trust lawyers. So far as uh, uh, lawyers are concerned, even credit cards come with great difficulty. Therefore, what is all this that is happening? How we see that lawyers have uh, uh, developed such a bad reputation? Now, uh, because it is true that the large section of lawyers in this country, they are doing a tremendous job, and including 
<coughs> bringing to the notice of the uh, Supreme Court and the High Courts the sufferings of the deprived sections of society where the courts have uh, been uh, quite quick in interfering for the purpose of, say, wiping away, as it were, a tear from every eye. In fact, uh, if you come to Justice Madan Loku's court, you will find every day three or four very, very important cases where the judgments, where the claims are not restricted to an individual, but affect a very large number of persons, whole populations, as it were. And uh, with one stroke of the pen, as it were, he was able to bring about relief and succor to a very large number of uh, 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 groups of persons. Now, therefore, there are, a, I think, the large percentage of lawyers, but there is a minority. And it is that minority which has to be brought to line by the Bar Council of India. And I don't think the Bar Council has been doing a very good job. And uh, either uh, in giving recognition to law schools or in taking disciplinary action. In most cases, the State uh, Disciplinary Committee of Peers of the lawyers, they do not uh, dispose of the case within a year, knowing that if that is so, it goes to the uh, Bar Council of India, the center. And so far as Bar Council of India is concerned, it is unable to cope up with a large number of disciplinary cases, as has been happening in England. And therefore, in those circumstances, one would wonder as to what should be the solution. One charge against lawyers is the very high fees that lawyers charge. But that is not something which happens throughout this country, because in the rural areas, the lawyers find it very difficult to make both ends meet. And 70% of the population live in the rural areas. And therefore, roughly 70% of the lawyers are there in the rural areas. And uh, they get a very little, uh, very small fee. And with great difficulty, the clients pay them uh, the fees. It's only when you go to the high courts and to the Supreme Court that you find that the fees are, uh, I think, uh, very, very high. And uh, so far as uh, that is concerned, it is only in the but then you should also realize that the total number of lawyers are very large. The Bar Council of India was claiming that there were more than one million lawyers in this country, the second largest in the world after the United States. But actually, when it came to a question of verifying their credentials, where they had to apply to the Bar Council and the various state Bar Councils for the purpose of recognizing the right to practice, they found it's only 50% of the total number of lawyers who had practicing, who had applied for being recognized for continuing practice. Perhaps a number of them may are dead, may have been, may, have been, may be no more. Many of them may have left the profession. Many of them may have gone abroad. But nevertheless, to find that only 50% were in practice was a matter of great surprise. And therefore, if you take the forget the one million, then you will find that about 500,000 lawyers are there practicing in the country. And a very large section of them are uh, not able to get a very great or affluent. Uh, this high fees, therefore, uh, I think it's a law commission with the under DSI who said that you have to put a cap on the fees. But that I don't think will ever uh, materialize because all that will happen is that the lawyers who are, uh, uh, I mean, who pay their taxes regularly will feel that if you put a cap, then it's unfair to them. And then you know the result of it. When you had a tax rate, income tax rate, of 93% at one time, where everybody was avoiding, professionals were avoiding, everyone else was avoiding taxes. And therefore, that will not be a good idea. I would think that you have to do something for the lawyers in the rural areas, especially. And I've been thinking of the system in the United States where contingent fee is one which is a recognized practice, which means that in the case where a money decree has to be obtained, 
so far as the client is concerned, he would not be able to afford it, in India especially, with high court fees. Now, therefore, so far as the client is concerned, he would go to a lawyer and say that I am unable to pay the fees. And if it is on the basis of a contingent fee, the lawyer would say, very well, we will enter into an agreement, we will register the agreement with the court where the case is to be heard, and 30% will be what I would take in an accident claim or in any other money claim, and 70% is yours. And if he succeeds, this 30% to the lawyer is disbursed by the court itself directly, and the 70% directly to the client by the court, in which event it is safeguarded, it is protected. Now, very many of the uh, litigants do not file their cases, do not go to court, the poor ones even, the farmers, the agriculturists, the tenants, and so on, because they know that so far as the court system is concerned, it is responsible for huge delays. I'm not saying the courts are uh, responsible. I would say the government is more responsible than the courts because they do not have sufficient infrastructure. India had only 10.5 uh, judges for uh, a million, uh, uh, b b this, for a million, uh, no, f I'm sorry, for 10,000 uh, uh, litigants. Now it has come up to 19. But as against 50 in other Western countries, in, com uh, in the Commonwealth countries, and 107 so far as United States is concerned. And unless the infrastructure and the courts and the judges are all increased, we are going to suffer. Therefore, eight years in the trial court, six years in the high court, six years in the Supreme Court, no litigant can survive this normally unless he is very rich. And therefore, if there is a contingent fee arrangement, he would be able to go to court and try to get his just uh, deserts. But if you do not provide for that, then I am afraid that so far as the litigants are concerned, because of the failure of the court system, because of the long delays, they have to write off their uh, uh, b b causes. And that, I think, will be a great tragedy because the Supreme Court, in its wisdom, has held that uh, the uh, b access, access to justice is a fundamental right. A number of fundamental rights are there. Many of them cannot be implemented. The Supreme Court has held that Article 21 entitles you to lead not a mere animal existence, but to live a life as a full human being, which means a roof over your head, the clothes on your back, the employment, and uh, shelter. Now, if all that is not there, if you do not have a job, if you are living uh, on a semi-civilized uh, level, then surely Article 21 has not helped you, though your rights have been declared under Article 21. Similarly, so far as even access to justice is concerned, if you do not provide for quick and cheap remedy, say within two years of filing the case, and appeals within one year, one year, which I think is utopia, I am afraid that you're seeking to wipe away every tear from every eye is only a mirage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Venugopal. Now may I call upon and request uh, Justice Rajendra Menon, Chief Justice, High Court of Delhi, to kindly deliver his address. Good evening, Justice Madan B. Lokur, Judge, Supreme Court of India, Shri K. K. Venugopal, Attorney General of India, Dr. Lalit Basin, President of the Bar Association of India, Mr. Chando, Vice President, Mr. Prashant Kumar, President elect, Dr. Pujari, the Honorary. General Secretary, the winners of the award today, gracious ladies, senior educates, and my friends from the bar. 
I am delighted and honored by the Bar Association of India for having given me this opportunity to be present amongst all of you. In fact, by inviting me to honor the legal luminaries, I am being honored because they have accepted me to honor them. The Bar Association of India, as the President-elect said, celebrates Lawyer's Day, which happens to be the birth anniversary of none other than Dr. Rajin Prasad, the first president of the association. I had occasion to be in Bihar for about 18 months before coming to Delhi. And while going through his hometown in Bhagalpur and also in the Patna High Court, I found what he has done for the legal profession. And honoring legal luminaries on his birth anniversary is a great job done by the Bar Association. Our constitution envisaged a vibrant democracy. You cannot visualize a democracy of that nature without a robust judiciary. And a robust judiciary cannot be visualized without a efficient and delegant bar. Rule of law is the primary concern for protection of the democracy. And in furtherance to that, the presence of a vibrant bar is of paramount consideration and importance. I had got a prepared note and thought of speaking to you on the basis of that note. But the Attorney General instigated me to deviate from that. And I think that is the most appropriate moment and an appropriate august gathering where I can say something about the concerns expressed by the Attorney General. I agree with each and everything that he had said about the state of things in the bar. And what he said is that it's not the entire bar that is responsible for the state of affairs. It's a very small handful of persons who are responsible for that. He's absolutely correct. I have experience of being on this side of the bar now for more than 16 years, I have been in places like Madhya Pradesh and Bihar. And I can tell you, it's only a handful of these people who create all the problems for the bar. And as the Attorney General said, a great responsibility for this lies on the Bar Council of India. And the question is, has the Bar Council been able to discharge its liabilities to the right, in the right earnest and for the purpose for which it was created? I have seen bar associations, particularly in the district and high courts level, headed by persons who have got nothing to do with the legal profession. I have dealt with a president of a very big bar association who happens to be president of the Tempo Association only and runs a business of Tempo in that city. I have dealt with general secretaries of bar association who run pawn shops. I have dealt with members of the bar association who are milk vendors. These people decide when the court should function, what should be an issue on which 
there should be boycotts of court and how the judge should decide a case now if that is the state of affairs and if these handful of people decide how the course of justice should follow then as the attorney general said it's high time we should think and people like us should come forward and do something for removing all these impediments which go a long way in not only effectively dispensing justice to the needy but also play a great great role in the increase of pendency and the docket outburst that we have now that apart infrastructure facility is another issue particularly in the subordinate courts what about court rooms and other infrastructure facility i can tell you there are about 80% courts in the state of bihar which don't even have a boundary wall a court without a boundary wall and the effect is i had to deal with complaints where the judge used to tell me that sir i can't even sit in my court because i have thousands of people coming with the accused to participate in the proceedings security concerns add to these so there are various issues which have to be addressed and it's only when all of us get together and deliberate 